Ma lui sta registrando? Ciao Beppe. Ciao. Ciao Fulvio, buongiorno. Ciao Peppe, buongiorno. Buongiorno. Tutto bene? Sì, sì. Oggi sono di più dentro che fuori. Oggi sono sei. Sei in aula. Allora, buongiorno a tutti. Se mi sento. Ok, bene. Tutti con la mascherina, bravi. Un po' la luce. Ma se lo apri un po'. Vogliamo provare, Fulvio, a fare condividi schermo, se tutto va? Ah, sì, sì, certo. Allora. Share screen. Ok. Lo vedete? Sì, sì. Riccardo, tu lo vedi da remoto? si vede tutto benissimo allora, faccio intanto una breve presentazione di un caro amico prima di tutto che è Fulvio Zonca è dottorato a Princeton tante attività di ricerca in giro per il mondo, tanta esperienza negli Stati Uniti e in Cina, capo della fisica a Frascati o anche a livello europeo, professore alla Zeyang University e da quattro anni anche nostro docente dal 2017, questo è il quarto anno, a, a Viterbo. Quindi lo ringrazio ancora. Lui fa le prime due lezioni ogni anno di introduzione al corso di lezione. Mi raccomando, attenzione, poi con Fulvio decideremo una domanda o due per valutare l'apprendimento a fine, fine corso. Riccardo, Gabriele, ok, mi pare che ci siamo tutti, no? Ok. Manca? Vogliamo fargli un colpo? Fulvio, se sei d'accordo farei... Eh, non, non so come preferisci 50 minuti, 10 minuti di pausa e poi sì, eh, per me va bene eh, cioè ditemi voi quanto vi serve di pausa e la, la ricaviamo a cavallo del, dell'ora eh, sì, 10 minuti sì. vanno bene e poi va bene. Eh, potete anche fare interruzioni quindi, quindi smettiamo, smettiamo alle 11.25 e riprendiamo alle 11.35. Sì, perfetto. Vabbè, vabbè. Spero, spero di esserci con, uh, con i tempi su... Eh, se no, continuiamo. No, no, spero di esserci con i tempi per, per beccare il, 
l'intervallo esattamente a metà. Comunque ah, okay. cer cerco di regolarmi. Okay. Che fa Alessio? Alessio c'è, eccolo lì, lo vedo. Ok, possiamo partire. Come vi dicevo, la lezione oggi la faremo in inglese, ho chiesto questa cortesia a Fulvio perché eh, la tecnologia della, per la fusione nucleare viene anche rilasciato diciamo, nella modalità MLS, cioè nella, nella modalità ridotta per studenti stranieri con... Uh, 18 ore in, in inglese, quindi ho scelto alcuni, alcune parti del programma per farle in inglese e ho chiesto anche a Fulvio di questa cortesia. Grazie Fulvio. Eh, grazie a te Peppe, quindi inizio, pa passo sì. all'inglese a questo sì. punto. Uh, so good morning everyone. <clears throat> uh, this uh, is the first lecture of a series of two. Uh, devoted to uh, introduction to plasma physics in these uh, uh, technologies for nuclear fusion. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Professor Calabro for his kind invitation uh, to give these two lectures. It is always a pleasure for me to uh, have the possibility to uh, lecturing uh, in, this, uh, in this course. So let me uh, shift to the full screen uh, view. So you should see full screen now? Yeah. Okay, good. So just a brief syllabus as a, as a start. Uh, so uh, as I said, we have two lectures, uh, one today, one tomorrow. Lecture one is devoted to the classification of plasma. So I. I would really start to from the basics. So I will introduce the Dubai lengths and what a plasma is and the uh, notion of collisions between charged particles. And uh, of course, uh, from that, one can calculate the collision of slowing down and the plasma resistivity. So these are the three items that are really the foundations of uh, all types of uh, plasma physics, plasma behavior that are for sure of interest to all of you. So I hope that you can get away from this introductory part with a solid understanding of these notions. And then we will move to uh, something more related to uh, the uh, nuclear fusion control, nuclear fusion. So what is the fusion reactor scheme and the power balance laws and criteria, and then speak about the ideal ignition temperature. This is for today. I will try actually to break it down in two pieces exactly at the at the at the half. Uh, let's see if I can handle that. So lecture two instead will be uh, concerned about the solution of the power balance equation and uh, uh, defining what how, what are the main heating and loss terms in the uh, power balance equation. So then uh, we will speak more generally about the. Uh, uh, performance uh, of a fusion reactant. So introducing the scaling laws for the energy confinement time and uh, speak about the uh, predominant configurations that are being used for a toroidal plasma confinement in magnetic fields. That means tokamaks and stellarators. And finally, uh, just as an appendix, uh, I would like to introduce briefly the uh, notion of inertial confinement fusion, because uh, since you are uh, dealing with the technology for uh, magnetic fusion, uh, you should also be aware about what uh, the uh, other approach to fusion uh, is, uh, is about. So let's uh, move uh, right away to uh, the classification of plasmas. 
So uh, essentially, uh, we have that a plasma is either a fully or partially ionized gas. So it's, uh, it's not truly speaking a gas in the sense that you have been uh, learning about in your university courses is ionized. Uh, so uh, not only it is ionized, but on the average, usually uh, is uh, is neutral uh, from the global point of view. That means it's uh, usually made of an equal part of positively and negatively charged particles. And uh, on the average is neutral, but exhibits collective behavior, which means that the individual particles react uh, not uh, to the individual particle, but as a collective, that means uh, global, uh, together with the neighbors, then we will really see what these neighbors are. Uh, they will react collectively to uh, long range interactions, not really short term, uh, sh short range interactions. So the main properties of these plasmas and the classification can usually, similar to what happens in uh, ideal gases, uh, be classified and assigned in terms of uh, the density and the temperature. So density is as usual number of particles per volume and the temperature uh, in, in fusion field is usually measured in terms of energy units, but you can measure it in absolute uh, uh, temperature. That's, uh, that depends on what you like, but usually, uh, the most often used uh, nomenclature is using uh, energy units. So um, all the characteristic plasma parameters that uh, we are interested in depend on uh, density and temperature. For example, uh, the, the by length, and we will define what the by length is uh, later. Uh, that is, uh, what is what it is in practice, is the characteristic length over which Coulomb potentially screened uh, the interparticle spacing uh, also is function of density is n to the minus one third and the distance of closest approach is also uh, a function of these parameters. The distance of closest approach as the, as the terminology says is uh, the distance, uh, uh, the minimum distance uh, that uh, two particles can be located at uh, in, uh, in the average. So plasmas, as I said, are classified according to the uh, parameters introduced above and especially on the ratio of the average kinetic energy uh, of the particles and the potential energy due to the interaction among the particles themselves, which are, uh, as I said, uh, dominated by the uh, Coulomb interaction. So uh, let's try to see in this figure what the classification he is here on the vertical axis. You see the temperature given in electron volts, uh, as uh, I said before, is in energy units. And here is the density in uh, uh, meter to the minus three. So uh, you see that, uh, of course, this uh, uh, is a very broad uh, 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 figure with a broad operation space. You see that here uh, on this, uh, uh, let's say top left corner, you see plasmas that tend to be hotter when you move up and less dense. So uh, in this region uh, is what we call weakly coupled plasma. Uh, weakly coupled plasma are defined uh, when the number of particles in a uh, Debye sphere uh, the bi-sphere because it's lambda cubed. So let's say that we have a sphere of radius lambda the bi, and we will see again what lambda the bi is, but we know already it is the typical distance over which the Coulomb potential is screened. So the number of particles in this sphere is uh, much larger than one. So these are the weakly coupled plasma. Uh, in this lower region, uh, instead, uh, there is the strongly coupled plasma where uh, this number is less than one or the order of one. Uh, there is also, and I say this for uh, completeness, uh, for those of you who had uh, some, some uh, uh, training in uh, uh, statistical mechanics, there is uh, the Fermi energy, which of course depends only on the density. Uh, when the temperature, the typical energy becomes uh, less than the Fermi energy, uh, 
you have the so-called degenerate plasmas, and these are typically uh, plasmas that are present in a metal. So uh, we will be dealing with uh, this type of uh, weakly coupled plasma, and depending on density and temperature, you have the solar wind uh, up here, the ionosphere, glow discharge, the corona of the, uh, of the stars, and typically the solar corona, and you have the tokamak and the fusion plasma core. You see that we are here in the range of very, very high temperature in the order of a 10 to the five, almost 10 to the six, and the densities in the order of 10 to the 20. And then if we move toward the right, but still having quite remarkable uh, temperature, we have the inertial confinement plasma. I mentioned it before, it is, uh, is confined using uh, rather than magnetic field is, uh, is done by laser. Uh, we will see this uh, tomorrow. And then there is the stellar interior. So you see that, of course, while you move up uh, with the density, uh, you tend to reach uh, conditions that you typically verify in the inside of the stars. So I'm a little nicer picture saying essentially the same thing. Uh, energy versus density, uh, units are different, centimeters to the minus three here, steel electron volts, and you see the same type of, uh, of classification. So this is the critical condition in which the energy is consistent with the, uh, the uh, interparticle uh, Coulomb uh, energy. So weakly coupled plasmas are here. Uh, this one uh, is the uh, degenerate plasmas uh, when we have uh, that the uh, Fermi energy becomes important. So there is a, a electrons inside a metal solar core here. And uh, uh, this is the classification. What I didn't say before is this uh, top uh, line here, of course, uh, uh, is the limit of the relativistic condition. So that cannot be overcome clearly. So what is the Debye length? Uh, uh, as we said before, uh, the Debye length uh, uh, is not just a characteristic feature of a plasma, but is really common to any ionized system in thermal equilibrium. So uh, as a matter of fact, it was not uh, really uh, introduced uh, in the study of plasmas, but it was historically introduced by, by Debye himself uh, in the study of electrolytes uh, that are, of course, uh, systems in which uh, uh, there are uh, charged particles. So essentially, uh, we have two ingredients. Uh, we have that we have a certain number of charged particles present, and we have that the system is in thermal equilibrium. Now, we all know that when the system is in thermal equilibrium, it uh, distributes itself according to the Gibbs distribution. So if we give uh, the scalar potential and the charge Q, uh, K is again Boltzmann constant and T is the thermal energy, uh, the uh, Gibbs distribution tells us that the density will be distributed according to this law. So is the average density and uh, there is according to the uh, energy uh, due to the uh, Coulomb interaction that is entering in this energy factor uh, weighted over the thermal energy. Now, if we assume, uh, because remember, uh, we are in the condition, as I said before, uh, that we are considering only weakly coupled plasma, which means that the Coulomb energy is typically less than the kinetic energy or the thermal energy. Uh, kinetic energy and thermal energy here are measure uh, one of the other, because essentially, as we all know, as in a uh, ideal uh, gas, uh, the average kinetic energy of the particle is connected with the thermal energy. So we, if we take this exponential and we expand it in Taylor series, truncating it to the first order, we have that the density of the particles essentially are a constant plus this linear dependence on the uh, potential. And we call this uh, like N tilde. So uh, if we assume that the uh, uh, system is neutral and in equilibrium and that there exists a neutralizing uh, ion background. So assume that uh, we have ions that of course being much heavier than electrons can be assumed to be at rest. So they uh, really are fixed at given positions in space. 
and the only thing that are uh, changing because of thermal energy is electrons that are much more rapidly uh, moving because they are lighter. So we assume, therefore, that ions cancel out this uh, N0 constant uh, uh, density and on, only the N tilde uh, uh, fluctuation of density or variation of density around the average because of the presence of the Coulomb potential is given by the electron. So the scalar potential function at this point satisfies the Poisson law. And here is uh, the divergence of the electric field. And here is the uh, presence of the electron distribution uh, that is, of course, given by N tilde. Plus, we assume that there is one additional charge with the same charge Q, in this case, electrons, uh, that is located at a certain position R0. OK, so what we are dealing with is our neutral plasma, where we identify one test charge. And we would like to see how, around that test charge, the potential is uh, being uh, uh, changed by the fact that there is the plasma, so this n tilde. So this is a differential equation uh, that is uh, uh, we know how to solve. Uh, and uh, we will see uh, right away how to solve it. So if we take the expression n tilde being given by what we derived before, so we derived it here, and substituting to uh, uh, the Poisson equation, essentially we obtain this type of uh, uh, description. Of course, if we take n tilde and factor it out, n tilde will be proportional to phi, right? So we can take it on the left-hand side, so we take this term here and we take it on the left hand side on the right hand side we will have only the delta function the Dirac delta function which is here is the source term and this is indeed the uh, equation that governs uh, the uh, scalar potential now what is lambda d here you just factor uh, all the contribution and you recognize that uh, if we write it down as one over lambda d square Lambda D, lambda D is given by this quantity. This is the Debye, the Debye length. And now we will see in a minute why this is the Debye length and what is the meaning. Remember that is the typical length over which the potential should be screened, right? So uh, let's look, take a look, a closer look to this equation. So uh, for sure, what you have been solving in your courses so far is uh, the condition in which uh, there is only this uh, minus nabla square here and uh, this uh, point charge here, no lambda d, okay? So let's take away uh, t. So there is uh, either zero energy or n zero goes to infinity. So there is no fluctuation inside the plasma. So it's a constant and common uh, uh, distribution which is neutralized down to zero. So uh, of course you know this equation because this is uh, essentially uh, what gives you the so-called bare potential. So usually we know that the scalar potential has uh, the dependence of Q over R. Sorry here, I am using CGS units. Uh, uh, those of you who like more MKS, you just replace the four pi with epsilon zero uh, with the right conditions. So it's, uh, it's just using uh, CGS units instead of MKS as usual. So uh, the uh, solution of Q over R will be essentially the uh, scalar potential solving this differential equation without the lambda D term. Now, uh, uh, what is uh, the solution in the presence of the lambda D term? So the lambda D term, uh, uh, which is of course, what creates the so-called screening is uh, just modify the potential and changes the solution to uh, Q over R, which is the bare potential, times this exponential factor. Now, uh, why should this be the solution? You just take uh, this solution and you substitute it back to this equation, and you will see that the presence of this factor will basically zero out the left-hand side. So only uh, behavior that is possible in this case will be uh, connected with this source, which is the reason why we have this pre-factor Q over R here. So uh, I am not asking you to solve this equation mathematically. Actually, this is 
one of the exercises I suggest you to do uh, because I think it's very instructive. Uh, you have all the tools in order to solve this, this differential equation. But the most important thing here is that you realize that this exponential factor is actually due to the presence of this one over lambda d squared. So is indeed uh, a consequence of the presence of the plasma itself and therefore of the screening. Why is this a screening? Because, because of the presence of the exponential factor, if you are at the distance r from the test charge, which is larger than lambda d, this goes rapidly away. So essentially what you can think of is that the uh, scalar potential is due to the usual potential, the bare potential, this will be of a charge in vacuum, plus the screened potential, which is essentially what is left over. So here I just add and subtract the bare potential. So this is actually the effect of the plasma, and this is the test particle potential in vacuum. So uh, you will see, therefore, that the action of the plasma is actually to uh, uh, change the uh, particle concentration, because remember that is connected with this uh, uh, perturbation in the density of the background plasma. So the particle around the test particle uh, distribute themselves such that essentially the particle is screened from the rest of the plasma. Uh, this is very important because essentially tell us that uh, the uh, electrostatic uh, interaction or generally speaking, the electromagnetic interactions inside the plasma cannot really reveal uh, the uh, single particle potentials below, uh, uh, sorry, beyond uh, uh, the length scale associated with the uh, the by length. So uh, this is the uh, screening uh, effect that I was talking about before. So now let's try to uh, go back to the notion I introduced originally that the, the by length essentially is a measure uh, of the ratio of the thermal energy over the Coulomb energy. Remember, a weakly coupled plasma is when the Coulomb energy and at an average distance is much less than the thermal energy. Uh, average distance, of course, can be typically taken as uh, the mean uh, interparticle spacing, uh, so n to the minus one third. Of course, particle can, can come closer to that, but on the average, particles sit at a distance n to the minus one third from each other. So if we take uh, what is the ratio of the thermal energy KT over Q times phi, Q times phi is Coulomb energy uh, that we have to calculate at this point at the position of the interparticle spacing. So we substitute back this uh, using for phi the expression that we have here, right? So uh, phi is given by this thing here. So we have to take R being one, one over n to the one third. So you see that naturally what happens here is n lambda d cube, everything to the one third. And so this is this factor here. So it's the exponential of the uh, number of particles inside of the biosphere to the one third power times this pre-factor. Now, uh, you rec recognize if you go back to this page and you take the explicit expression of lambda d, is that all this pre-factor can also be expressed in terms of uh, n times lambda d and is actually n lambda d cubed to the two third power. So you see that this uh, ratio between the thermal energy over the Coulomb energy at the interparticle spacing is actually only a function of one number, uh, one scalar number, which is the number of particles inside at the biosphere. Now you see right away that when n lambda d becomes larger than one, not only for this three factor, but especially because of this other factor here, uh, this number becomes very, very large. So what does this mean? It means that the particle essentially feel very weakly the uh, Coulomb energy uh, modulation inside the plasma and predominantly uh, move almost freely uh, in the plasma because of the thermal energy. So, <clears throat> 
the ratio of the thermal energy over the Coulomb energy is larger or smaller than unity, depending on the number, uh, we call it big lambda, which is the number of particles inside uh, at the biosphere. So fusion plasma, as I said before, is characterized by this number being much larger than one and are the weakly coupled plasma dominated, therefore, by the collective effects. Why the collective effects? Because uh, the uh, uh, effect uh, due to the interparticle interactions are due, of course, to the uh, interaction of one particle, one charged particle with another charged particle. And so their interaction or potential energy is connected with the Coulomb energy, but this is small. So essentially what happens if uh, the interaction between two particles is small is that everything else that can exist in such a system will have a, or be characterized by length scales or interactions that exist over lengths that are larger than lambda divided. Uh, and this is exactly what we call uh, a collective behavior. So the fusion plasmas will be dominated by collective effect. For example, if we uh, apply from outside an uh, electromagnetic field like electromagnetic wave that has a typical wavelength larger than lambda d, uh, what we will have is that the plasma will respond to that uh, long range electric field as a whole piece, so as a collection of particles that uh, do behave uh, very similarly in uh, nearby regions of the space. So the distance now, uh, other thing that I mentioned before of closest approach, uh, which is usually labeled B, is reached uh, when Coulomb energy is equal to the kinetic energy. So now here uh, we have calculated this number. So ratio between kinetic energy and Coulomb energy at an average distance. So the question is how close uh, below the interparticle spacing uh, the particle can go? And uh, the answer is here. So when we have that the average kinetic energy, which is three halves kT, uh, is in the order of uh, Q times phi. And Q times phi, of course, uh, since we are uh, at the distance smaller much smaller than the, uh, the by length. Remember what we have done here. So if R here is smaller than lambda the by, you expand this in again, uh, uh, Taylor, Taylor series. Uh, at the lowest order, this is exponential is one and we'll cancel this one. And next order, there will be a minus R over lambda D, but for R much less than lambda D, this will be a small factor con connected uh, in correction to this bare potential. So if we are at the distance B, which is much less than lambda D, uh, then we can estimate phi as the bare potential. So this will be Q squared over B. That's why I don't put an additional correction here uh, using the actual screen potential because the screening at the length scale below lambda D is essentially ineffective as this formula tells you. So uh, that, that, that we have this type of condition that allows us to solve for B, what is the distance of closest approach. And again, is given by this expression. This is just algebra. So I don't bother you with the details. I think that you can reproduce these details by yourself very easily. And this again is connected B uh, with the uh, uh, density and again, lambda D. So the ratio between B and lambda D is one over six pi, this is a numerical factor. Again, you see that there is this lambda. So basically a lambda much larger than one as we have in weakly coupled plasma tells you that the distance of closest approach is much less than the Debye length. So essentially uh, uh, recapping uh, what we have said so far, a weakly coupled plasma is a ionized gas where the ratio between the thermal energy over the Coulomb energy at an average distance is much larger than one. Uh, that means uh, the weakly coupled plasma is dominated by the collective effects when it's interacting with long range 
electromagnetic field. Long range means uh, with length scales that are much larger than the by length. And incidentally, the distance of closest approach. So the minimum distance at which two particles can reach each other, which is called B, is typically much less than the by length, uh, which means that particles can get very, very close together. And at that distance, they see each other as bare particles. So we will call these events when two particles, two uh, arbitrarily chosen particles inside the plasma, get sufficiently close to see each other in terms of the bare potential, we call this a Coulomb collision because the particles can come close enough, but on the average, stay away from each other. So what is the collisions between the charged particles? This is exactly what I just introduced in terms of, uh, of notion. So the particles on the average stay away from each other. Particles who are far away from each other in terms of uh, the by length, so at, at a distance much larger than the by length, don't feel each other because essentially the large number of particles that falls inside of the biosphere uh, provides an effective screening. So a particle that is outside of the biosphere from another particle doesn't feel the presence of that particle. So that's in that sense, the particle is completely screened. However, particle, because they have a, such a high kinetic energy, can actually uh, fly from far away from a particle that they don't see because they are screened away. They fly inside the device sphere. And when they do that, they can, they can come close enough to actually feel and see the particle as a bare particle. And they will have uh, interaction with that particle that we call a Coulomb collision. So this is the situation we have in a, uh, weekly coupled plasma. Now we will be uh, looking a little more uh, in detail into uh, the collisions between charged particles and uh, essentially do uh, a little more in-depth analysis of the so-called Coulomb scattering. Uh, scattering means deflection, okay? So essentially here you see uh, one charged particle that we take as a target. Uh, uh, we write it down as a big dot, big black dot, assuming that this particle has a very large mass. So in the interaction, this particle is like a fixed point. So we will come back to this point later, actually. And there are here other particles that are much lighter. So this is fixed. These have a lighter mass. They come inside. And when they go sufficiently close, they see the bare potential. So assuming that uh, the particle is uh, uh, same charge. Uh, otherwise, the behavior will be similar, but uh, uh, not particularly different. Can be deflected and come back. Or if the impact parameter, which is the distance between the axis uh, of the collision and the, the uh, direction of the particle. So this is the impact parameter that classify uh, the, uh, the type of uh, interaction we have in a Coulomb collision. So if the impact parameter grows larger and larger, of course, uh, the distance of closest approach will become uh, larger and the deflection will be smaller and smaller and smaller the farther away you, you go. Of course, if you go very far away, farther away uh, than the Coulomb, uh, uh, sorry, uh, than the uh, Lambda Dubai, the deflection will be very small because the potential will be effectively screened. Now, when you uh, uh, speak about scattering or interaction between particles, uh, the language of physics uh, uh, classifies the strength of the interaction in terms of the notion of the cross-section. Now, uh, let's try to uh, uh, define what the cross-section is. I think that uh, very likely many of you have studied this in the undergraduate courses. Uh, however, let's just introduce this notion uh, for everyone, assuming that you never encounter this. So if you <clears throat> want to describe 
uh, the possibility of having one event. And this is uh, uh, applicable to any type of event. Uh, that means in this case is the deflection of the particle. So you can put yourself at a certain point, observation point here, and you want to measure how many particles get in this observation point. And so you start counting the particle. In particular, you can start counting the rates of events. So how many particles per seconds do you detect here? Of course, uh, when you do this type of experiment, uh, or let's say that you have a detector, so in, and you look at the data from this detector, the, the number of events will be trivially proportional to the density of the particles that you are throwing on the target. So if you make uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, bullets you are shooting uh, over these targets uh, twice uh, as dense, you will get twice uh, the number of counting. So the number of counting or the rate of events will be directly proportional to the number uh, density of the particle that are coming in. Another point that is trivial uh, uh, in the number of events that you observe here is that if the velocity of the particle that are coming in are made double, uh, that will be directly proportional to this. So it will be obviously proportional to the density and obviously proportional to the velocity of the bullets. So uh, if you measure this, n times v is actually the flux, right, of the uh, uh, bullets that uh, you are shooting. Uh, this is uh, very, very intuitive. So uh, when you have uh, this uh, number of event or number of counting, uh, you will not be surprised to see this uh, direct proportionality to the flux uh, of the bullets you are trying to shoot on the target. So uh, if you take this uh, obvious trivial uh, dependence away, everything else uh, will be called sigma, okay? So n dots will be obviously proportional to n times v and will be proportional to sigma. Now, everything that uh, contains the uh, interaction between the bullets and the target will be described by this uh, factor sigma. Uh, if you take uh, the dimensionality of this system, this is number, so number per second, this is uh, uh, meter to the minus three. This is uh, a meter per second. And therefore, sigma must have the dimensionality of a cross section of a surface. And this is what it is defined to be the cross section of these events. So this can be applied to anything you want. Uh, and in principle, is the notion, very, very general notion of cross section. Sometimes, rather than measuring the number of events per time that you can measure here, you could say how many of the events I measure here are coming from the interaction that is contained in this specific range in the x direction, which is the direction along which you are shooting your bullets, because you may have not only one target, uh, you may have two targets or three targets or four targets, and then at that point, if you have more targets, you might be interested in knowing how many counting are coming from uh, targets that are within a certain type of range. In this case, of course, you just uh, normalize everything by V and uh, dn dt over V, V dt is dx, and, and therefore the number of event per length uh, that are uh, gone through by your uh, bullets is the density, again, of the bullets time sigma. Okay, so uh, this is the general definition of the cross section. So let's try to look more carefully into what is the process we are trying to study. And this is actually given by these bullets that is coming into the target is reaching a minimum distance. This is the distance of closest approach and then gets deflected, all right? So this uh, is actually uh, uh, the uh, fundamental problem of calculating the cross section. So what is, what is the cross section? The cross section, of course, in this case, uh, will be uh, rather easy to calculate, right? Because if we have a certain impact parameter B and we have 
a change in the impact parameter, okay, delta B, uh, the surface uh, that is, trans, uh, is, is crossed by your bullets is this circular area, right? And the surface will be two pi B delta B, okay? I'm just writing what is the surface or the section of this thing. Now, we said that we wanted to uh, understand what is the scattering cross-section. Remember, the scattering cross-section will be the number of particles that will come out, for example, with a certain deflection angle, right? So we have a deflection angle theta. And so we would like to know uh, how many particles come out with a certain deflection between theta and theta plus delta theta. So uh, the fraction of the particles that are coming out are essentially the ratio between this area and the area given here, assuming a radius of unity, right? Because we have to uh, preserve the ratio between this and this, that is uh, a fractional area that we are looking at. But this fractional area uh, will be just two pi sine theta because it's this radio, ra radius times delta theta. And so uh, this ratio will be actually our uh, scattering cross section. Now I'm putting a minus in front of here because this will be incremental, right? So if we want to make uh, uh, a meaningful evaluation, essentially what we have to do is we have to take that this ratio must be positive definite. But if we take uh, B larger, we know that uh, you see here, we take larger B theta decreases, right? The largest B will be for the smallest theta. So if you in interpret this delta B over delta theta as a derivative and uh, not take a sign in the delta theta corresponding, uh, we have to take a minus sign in front of it because dB d theta will be a negative function. We know that we, if we are increasing theta, uh, B uh, uh, will be coming smaller or uh, the other way around. So that's why there is a minus sign in front of here. So we know that sigma can be calculated as a ratio between uh, B and sine theta and the derivative of B with respect to theta. Okay, so if we can in somehow connect what is the relationship between impact parameter and deflection angle, we'll be able to calculate what is the uh, differential cross-section which is called the Rutherford cross-section. So let's do derive the Rutherford cross-section very uh, simply. So we have the impact parameter, and again, we have the target. Let's assume that is a nucleus. Uh, I, I'm saying is a nucleus because uh, historically, the Rutherford cross-section was derived by Rutherford, looking at the deflection of a particle impinging on a target nucleus. And therefore, uh, I preserve this type of uh, terminology. Now, if you have the impact parameter and uh, uh, you have this is the trajectory, by symmetry, of course, uh, you look at this picture, this will be B. So uh, the same impact parameter you will have also in the uh, emerging trajectory after the collision. Then uh, by symmetry, you can introduce a, a symmetry plane. And because of the symmetry plane, uh, uh, the trajectory will be symmetric around the symmetry plane by definition. So if you have that P is the momentum of the impinging particle and uh, this P uh, initial and P final will be the momentum of the scattered particle, uh, because of this, the variation of P, the variation of momentum will be two MV0, MV0 is, the momentum of the initial particle times uh, sine theta over two because of this construction, is geometric construction. So we know what is the variation of the uh, linear momentum. We also know that the force is associated to the particle one and particle two because essentially is the coulomb potential. So the force will be E1, E2, product of the two charges over R squared, and ER is the unit vector connecting uh, point by point the target and the impinging particle. So the force projected uh, along the symmetry plane will be just by construction 
e, e1, e2 over r squared times cosine phi, where phi is this angle, the angle between this vertical line and uh, uh, the uh, direction of the uh, symmetry plane. So if we want to calculate actually uh, the uh, variation of delta p in order to make a connection, remember that what we are looking at is the connection between b and theta. <clears throat> so if we want to calculate this connection, uh, we would like to express this delta p as a function of the impact parameter because we know already how it depends on, uh, on theta, on the scattering angle. Uh, so when we do this, of course, this will, this will be, as we derived here, uh, will be proportional to 2mv0, v0 is the initial velocity, times sine theta over 2. Now, in order to calculate explicitly this integral, essentially what we do, uh, we know that this, if this is a central force field, so it's always uh, the force connected uh, in terms of direction only with the, the, the uh, unit vector connecting the two points. So the uh, bullet and the target nucleus. So because of this is a central force and the conservation of angular momentum must be ensured. So we know that L, which is uh, by construction mv0 times b times the impact parameter and point by point along the trajectory should be mr squared times d phi dt, right? because that's the velocity uh, point by point on the trajectory. So allows us essentially to express the distance r square uh, in terms of the initial position because it will be just v0 times b over d phi dt. But then this is really a piece of cake because if you substitute this r square inside this integral, it turns out the delta p you see that there is no need anymore to know point by point what is the relationship between r and phi. So we don't really need to solve for the motion along this uh, trajectory. We just need to take a very simple integral because it's going to be e1, e2 over v0, b, these are constant, times the integral over cosine phi d phi. But we know what is the integral co cosine, right? So we just need to uh, uh, calculate the difference between the uh, final value of the phi angle and the initial value of the phi angle. Again, if you go here and you look at the uh, initial and final value of the uh, angles phi, the initial value will be just minus one half pi minus theta and the final one will be one half pi minus theta. So the difference of the signs of these two is just uh, simple trigonometry. Uh, again, uh, I will let you uh, go into the details later. I, I don't think that uh, there is any need to uh, provide you more information is just uh, do the uh, 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 trigonometry that is behind this. And this is just going to be two, twice the cosine of theta over two. But then if we know this, you go back to this equation here and you do very, very little algebra and you obtain that B, the impact parameter is connected with theta, the scattering angle by this equation here. So this is very, very important actually, because once we know the dependence of B on theta, as I said before, here it is, we are able to calculate the scattering cross section. Okay, so here we are again. And we just take the derivative of B with respect to theta using this formula. Watch the sign here again. Uh, we obtain the Rutherford cross section being uh, the product of the two charges square. Remember that there is one B and another B. Okay, so each B bears uh, a product of charges here and one over energy. So very interesting uh, is that there is an E square down here. And that will be assigned to the fourth power over theta over two. So uh, this is actually uh, the important consequence of the Rutherford cross section. The higher the energy, the lower is the cross section. It means that, and is intuitive, that if you take a bullet with very, very, very strong energy, the deflection angle will be smaller. 
So if you take an extremely energetic particle, we almost don't see the uh, uh, target for the scattering. And this is actually what is very important for uh, the fusion plasma. We will see it later. And the other thing is, of course, there is this uh, uh, very strong dependence on the charge, another point which is very important. And there is this extremely strong dependence sign to the fourth power of the scattering angle. That means the small angles will be very, very important. Uh, that is another point. So from the derivation of the scattering cross-section by Rutherford, we know that in these processes, is extremely, extremely probable, extremely likely. Remember that the number of events is proportional to sigma. So if you stay at an angle which is very small, you count a lot more than if you stay with a detector or a counter that is off your target by 90 degrees, all right? And if you take low energy, particle, they count a lot more, they can be deflected a lot more than the particle with the high energy. That is what is told you by this. So let's try to quantify this a little bit uh, more and then uh, we will stop soon. Uh, let's try to evaluate what is the uh, importance of the large uh, uh, versus small angle scattering, okay? So uh, as I said before, it all depends on the dependence on the scattering angle, uh, this. So the probability of scattering, let's say at theta larger than 90 degree is connected with the cross section, okay? When theta is larger than 90 degree. So theta larger than 90 degree will be pi, the surface, right? Times the impact uh, factor that corresponds to the scattering at 90 degree. Now, the impact factor that corresponds to the scattering at 90 degree is coming from here. So you can calculate the B connected with that and will be simply uh, this product here, E1, E2 over 2E. So you take it square. So we know already what is sigma for scattering of angles larger than this. So because of the small angle deflection due to the a single collision is essentially connected with B by this formula. Why? Because we take cotangent here and we expand it cotangent for small theta. So it means that cosine of theta by two is essentially one and sine of theta by two is essentially theta by two. All right, so uh, the angle deflection, because of this, it will be given by this. So uh, the mean square deflection of a particle traveling a certain distance will be essentially given by the integral over uh, this thing. So uh, we want to take, if sigma is a probability of uh, having a certain number of deflection and we are summing over all this deflection, we take the number, of uh, the deflection square, and we actually calculate over uh, the average over sigma times sine theta in the delta theta. And this uh, is by definition, the probability of having the counts according to the formula we showed before, which is this one, okay? So we are just taking the number integral of the number of event and calculating what is the probability over uh, all the possible uh, uh, scattering events. When you take this integral, it will be just a very, very simple integral of this, this type. Delta theta squared BDB, but uh, BDB is connected with delta theta from this equation. And again, uh, if you collect the various terms, this will be uh, producing just a ratio of the logarithm of the maximum and the minimum B that we are taking into account. So we know that the average deflection angle will be dominated by the small B. And there will be, of course, B max is uh, essentially uh, connected with the, uh, the by length, right? We said before that if we go and take in this picture an impact parameter that is larger than the by length, this particle will not essentially be seen by the by by 
the bullet and therefore we will not have crossing a uh, 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 scattering sorry so this is going to be the b max and the b mean of course uh, is what we defined before being the deflection at the 90 degrees right so the b b b mean is uh, what we calculated before so if we substitute back in the expression for this delta theta square we know that uh, this ratio will be essentially connected look again uh, at the number uh, connected with uh, the uh, Coulomb logarithm. That, that means n lambda d cube. Again, this number, which is very, very big, right? So uh, the value of the deflection angle average square will be connected essentially to the, Coulomb, uh, uh, to the Coulomb logarithm, the logarithm of the number of particles inside of the biosphere and with the dependence of the scatter uh, of the uh, Rutherford cross section. So uh, again, what can we do at this point? So we can compare this with what we know from before, the uh, uh, scattering uh, uh, due to the, the uh, uh, larger than 90 degree. So at this point, we can say that uh, if delta theta is one uh, that allows to estimate what is, uh, the length uh, that uh, needs to be traveled by a test particle in order to undergo a scattering uh, by 90 degrees due to the superposition of many scatterings, right? So here what we calculated is what is the average deflection because the particle goes through many, many scattering at small angles. So what we are saying, again, coming back to this initial picture, we are not only calculating one scattering, we are summing over many of the scatterings at small angles. So we are assuming, we are asking, what is the ratio of the probability of having one single scattering here at 90 degree over the possibility that many of these events like small scattering after uh, repeating and repeating and repeating the scattering can end up having uh, the same effect of scattering at 90 degree. So uh, of course we have to evaluate what is the length uh, that needs to be traveled by the test particle to undergo the uh, large scattering. So we are imposing this to be uh, of order one. And then the length at this point that we are solving from here, if this is one, the length that we are solving is essentially proportional to the energy square and uh, inversely proportional to the density and the logarithm of the number of particles in the, uh, uh, the biosphere. So the cross section that corresponds to these events, if this is the length, will be one over the uh, density of the targets times the length. Why this? We go again here, sigma will be the number of particle and one over the uh, density times the length traveled, right? So sigma will be uh, one over n times the length and it will be given by this. At this point, uh, this is the probability of uh, having a scattering at 90 degree because of the superposition of many events. And we know instead that the single event at 90 degree is given by the expression we obtained before. Now, if you take the ratio between the two things, this one and this one that we, sorry, this one that we calculated this, this way is proportional to the logarithm of this number. Now, the logarithm of this number, in, in addition to the factor of eight, is typically 15 to 20, in a, uh, in a plasma of interest for nuclear fusion. This means that inside a plasma, the collisions are dominated by processes uh, due to the small angle scattering. So whenever you see that collisions do affect uh, the particles inside a plasma is never due to the uh, effect of one isolated collision, but is due to the effect of multiple collision and this is by a factor which is very large so if you measure one event of scattering at 90 degree 
there is 1% probability that this comes from one single collision, and there is 99% probability that this comes from multiple collision that eventually have deflected the uh, impinging particle by 90 degrees. And this is uh, the moment in which I think we can make a break. Actually, I am a little late, five minutes late. So let's say that this is uh, uh, on my watch is 32. We can come back at 42, 1142 for the rest of the lecture, if that is OK for you. Is OK? OK. 10 minutes break. Okay, that's not too much. Okay. okay, welcome back. I hope you had your cup of coffee. So, uh, Please give me a okay or green light uh, when I can start. Yeah, one minute that are okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, please take please. take your time. No, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Pronto? Eh, scusa, mi sto facendo una lezione. <ride> no. De... Ah, grazie mille. E tu? Eh, tutto bene? Va bene, va bene. Ci, ci, sentiamo, ci sentiamo dopo, scusami. No, scusa tu. Ciao, ciao. Possiamo iniziare? Sì, sì, possiamo iniziare. Ok. All right. So, uh, welcome back. Uh, I, I, I hope that uh, you, you could recover a little bit from all the, from all the math we did. But now, uh, I hope that you can uh, appreciate why we went through that uh, exercise. I think that it's uh, uh, of fundamental importance that uh, you have seen at least once in your life the derivation of the Rutherford cross section and uh, that uh, you know how to handle uh, the notion of the cross section and the calculation with it. Uh, so essentially what, what I showed you is a very, very simple analysis of the Rutherford cross section. And as essentially, it assumes that the recoil of the nucleus is uh, negligible. Now, we know uh, in general how to deal uh, a two-body problem uh, in, uh, in physics. And uh, the, the very simple way is uh, introducing uh, the general notion of the center of mass. Uh, all of you know about that. So if we uh, label by one the beam particle and two the target, uh, we have this uh, very... Uh, uh, simple relationship. So we have R is the distance between uh, uh, the beam and the target. Uh, big R is the center of mass. So each of the particle can be represented in terms of the position of the center of mass and the position uh, relative to each other. And uh, of course, uh, the uh, conservation of energy and angular momentum uh, is uh, quite easily uh, uh, introduced and also denoting X as the direction of the initial beam propagation and Y, the direction transverse to it. Uh, of course, we can plot the position of the particle one and the velocity therefore also. Uh, in terms of the corresponding quantity of the center of mass and uh, of the uh, relative position. So for example, what we know is that V1 in the X direction will be the, the velocity of the uh, center of mass in the initial position, which is this one obtained readily from this one. 
And uh, of course, this other piece will be this object here. And uh, of course, R will be the velocity relative to each other. That will be V0 cosine theta. And theta is the deflection angle. And V0 is the initial velocity, which of course is conserved because the energy is conserved. And uh, same thing for the y direction will be V0 sine theta. And there will be not this piece because by definition, the center of mass is moving only in the direction of the initial beam velocity and not in the y direction. And uh, it couldn't be otherwise. So uh, this defines the kinematics uh, of the interaction. So uh, for, for, uh, from, from uh, each moment, you will know uh, the initial and the final uh, uh, values of the velocity. This, of course, will be in terms of V1 and V2. That means will be in the lab frame, in the laboratory frame, not in the frame of the center of mass, OK? So from the kinematics, one can obtain the relationship between the scattering angles in the laboratory and in the center of mass. For example, we know if the theta is the scattering angle in the center of mass frame, then uh, calling theta L the scattering or in the laboratory frame, we know, of course, that uh, taking the ratio of V1X and V1, sorry, V1Y and V1X will uh, give us the tangent, right? Will give us the tangent of the scattering angle in the lab frame. Actually, it's easier if you uh, plot it one over this, taking the cotangent on the angle, and the rest will be essentially given in terms of the mass ratio and the trigonometrical function of theta, that means the scattering angle in the uh, center of mass frame. And you readily derive this thing. It's just taking the ratio of these two quantity. OK, so it will be just a simple thing to do. Now, why do we do this? Because when we make measurements, we don't uh, uh, measure the scatterings in the center of mass, but we measure the scatterings in the lab frame, so in the fixed frame uh, with laboratory. Uh, what is very important to note here, uh, that there are special cases of interest. Of course, this is a complicated relationship in general. But of course, if we take, for example, the scattering of heavy particle, uh, 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 of heavy particle, sorry. So if M2 is much larger than M1, OK? So if this is uh, negligible, we have that the scattering in the laboratory is essentially the same as uh, in the center of mass frame, which is actually the exercise that we did before. Instead, if we take the scattering of like particles, so M2 and M1 are about the same, we have, and it's easy to obtain from here, is that the scattering in the laboratory frame is roughly half of what <clears throat> is measured in the, uh, in the center of mass frame, uh, which uh, is intuitive. Uh, but still is in the same range of uh, the scattering of the heavy particle. <clears throat> Sorry. Now, instead, if we do the scattering of light particles, that means the target is much lighter than the uh, 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 beam, then the scattering in the lab frame is extremely small compared to the scattering in the center of mass frame. So if M2 is much less, Essentially, if you take a truck that is trying to be deflected by something light, uh, like a pedestrian, the truck will not be scattered by the pedestrian, unfortunately for the pedestrian, right? Is, uh, uh, the scattering angle will be very small. So essentially, these are all important points when we want to calculate uh, what is the deflection rate for uh, uh, the time it takes for the particle to be deflected. So uh, the characteristic time for a particle to be deflected by 90 degree, which is a measure, if you want, of uh, uh, how long we have to wait before the effect of collision come into play, is defined by uh, a time that is the ratio between the lengths that we calculated before the break over the velocity. Now, the ratio between length over the velocity, you just go back and take the same uh, uh, expression of the length. 
Now, remembering that the mass dependence we had before is, will be expressed in terms of the, uh, 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 the, the, the uh, uh, effective mass, right? The reduced mass. And uh, uh, this will be, of course, the product, uh, the geometric mean of the masses involved in the interaction and is going to be given by this expression. Now, uh, this depends on uh, a number of things. Uh, depends on energy in this way. That's what we defined before. Depends on the density of the targets, but especially it depends on uh, little m. And uh, this means that for electron-electron and electron-ion collision, remember, like particle scattering electron on electron or electron on ion, so uh, scattering off every particle. Essentially, the uh, deflection at 90 degree in the center of mass is a good representation for the deflection in the laboratory frame. However, uh, for the uh, ion electron collision, because of the relationship we obtained before, so the scattering, the efficient scattering in the lab frame is much less than in the center of mass frame, it will be taking uh, uh, the mass ratio, mi over me. Remember that this number, especially if we have deuterium over an electron, is 3,600 roughly, right? It takes a much longer distance to have a deflection of an ions because a collision of electrons. So essentially, we have that the electron electron and the electron ion scattering rate is given by uh, the same expression we obtained before. Uh, for uh, the ion-ion collision, uh, just remembering that there is uh, uh, this uh, effective mass here uh, in front, it will be longer by a square root of the mass ratio. And uh, for the ion-electron collision, it will be a scaling uh, with the full mass ratio. And uh, this means, therefore, that electron and uh, electrons are very easily scattered, either by electrons or ions. Ions tend to be scattered by ions uh, on a much longer, roughly 60 times longer time scale, and ions will be deflected by electrons on an even much longer scale, 3,600 times more longer. And the same thing can be calculated for the change of momentum. Uh, and of course, you can uh, calculate what is the change of momentum in the x direction and the change of energy corresponding to that, again, given by this formula. I'm just reflecting again this simple thing and calculating how much uh, uh, momentum and energy is exchanged uh, using the, again, Rutherford cross section in the lab frame and the uh, various masses, it turns out again that uh, what is very, very efficient is uh, uh, changing uh, uh, momentum. Now, changing momentum, what does it mean? And, and this is actually very important because it is connected uh, with the uh, transfer of the fusion energy to the thermal plasma. It's connected with a change of momentum. Now, changing in momentum means friction is like a particle that is moving through uh, a jam type substance. So it is slowing down, means it loses energy, but is also losing momentum through a friction force. So the friction or the slowing down rate, in this case, change of momentum transfer, is going to be extremely efficient for electron on electrons and uh, for electron on ions. So, the uh, slowing down time is in the order of the uh, collision time or the deflection time by 90 degree. So the rate at which the momentum is being uh, uh, changed inside the plasma is the, uh, in the order of the time it takes for a particle to be scattered by 90 degree. That's why uh, we entered so much into such a detailed analysis. And the same is if electrons are being uh, 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 slowed down by the ions. However, if ions have to be slowed down by collisions on ions, it takes longer for them. And uh, of course, the shorter time scale here is this one. And by moving on the right hand side, we have a longer time scale. So uh, the ions on ions uh, slow down less efficiently and it takes 
60 times longer typically for an ion to be slowed down by collision on ions. So if someone is asking you, but one ion is being slowed down because of collisions with electrons or other ions, uh, you might tend to say with ions because of course ions are, are, are heavier and the answer is, is wrong, okay? So if the answer is wrong because they are more efficiently uh, uh, slowed down by collision on electrons. And uh, similarly, uh, if you ask uh, if iron are uh, slowed down by electrons uh, is, is also even, even uh, uh, it takes even longer. So uh, the uh, final thing that we need to uh, calculate is how long it takes to transfer energy uh, uh, because of Coulomb collision. And again, the scale is the deflection uh, time for an electron to be scattered at 90 degree, either by electrons or ions. And the electron-electron energy exchange is in the same order. It's very, very fast. But the uh, time it takes for ions to transfer energy to ions is longer. It's longer again, 60 times with respect to the time it takes for electron to transfer energy among each other. And of course, if you take uh, the uh, time it takes for energy to flow from e electrons to ions or to ions uh, uh, from ions to electrons, then it takes even longer, 3,600 times longer. So essentially, what do we get out of this? And this is extremely important because it tells you a lot about what is happening inside a plasma just by analyzing the behavior of the scattering cross-section due to the Rutherford scattering, which is what we did in the first half of this lecture. So electrons essentially equilibrate very fast because now I, I think what, what's, uh, what, what we are calculating here. We are calculating how fast uh, particles because of collisions among themselves can exchange momentum and energy measuring this time scale as the typical time scale the particle take to be deflected by collision at 90 degree and we see that this process is dominated not by one single collision by but by many 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 multiple collision okay so anytime you see one uh, scattering event is is due to uh, a large number of collisions now electrons because of this exchange of energy tend to equilibrate between each other, right? So uh, we are putting, for example, energy inside the plasma, trying to heat the plasma. And uh, the question is how long it takes for electrons to equilibrate uh, uh, among themselves. And uh, they equilibrate and reach thermal equilibrium more or less on the same time scale it takes for electrons to be scattered at 90 degree. Ions instead, because of this, right? the ion-ion uh, uh, equilibration time takes longer. So ions, if you are warming up ions, ions equilibrate among themselves on a time scale, which is 60 times longer than this one. And finally, ions and electrons exchange energy among each other on even longer time scale. So uh, uh, this, for example, uh, tells you what is the time scale over which you can consider that the plasma behavior is a fluid behavior. Because you know that a fluid tells you that you are characterizing a gas or a plasma in terms of average quantity. Like for example, temperature, right? If you want to say what is the temperature of a gas or a plasma, you must think that uh, there is a temperature to measure, but means that uh, locally, at least, a, a, a thermal equilibrium has been reached. If you are considering processes that are uh, occurring on this time scale, and these are millisecond time scale, uh, you cannot think that ions had time to equilibrate on that time scale. So if you have some fluctuations inside the plasma, that change or deliver energy too fast, ions cannot equilibrate among themselves. And of course, what they cannot do, they cannot equilibrate with electrons or electrons cannot equilibrate with ions. 
So this gives you important feelings on how long it takes in a plasma for different species of particle, electrons, ions, and so on, to exchange energy among themselves. And now this also allows us to calculate what is the plasma resistivity. So the equation of motion for electrons, for example, is this one, right? This is the acceleration on electrons and we put an external electric field here and there will be a friction, right? The friction, remember, is uh, the slowing down time in this case. So is this time here, which is in the order of the electron scattering time at 90 degrees. And so this is going to be given by this because the time is uh, the typical time over which the electrons change momentum, right? So if we define the current density as usual as minus E times the flux, the equation of motion can be written as an equation of motion for J for the evolution of the current density and is given by this one. So uh, of course uh, there will be in this case just uh, electric field because it's normalized by the charge and this one will be essentially J. Now uh, of course if you look at this this is the equation for the evolution of the current density and of course uh, when the current density doesn't evolve anymore, electric field and this term must be balancing each other. And this tells you essentially that electric field and J are related by a linear dependence with each other. And the constant proportionality is going to be the plasma resistivity. So this, uh, this being equal to zero is essentially Ohm's law. So eta is given by this quantity here. And we, but we know what tau EI is, right? So we have calculated uh, with the uh, exercise we did in the first half of the lecture, we calculated what is the plasma resistivity. And again, what is very interesting, because of the uh, dependence of the uh, Rutherford cross-section on energy, you see that there is a dependency on temperature or energy to the three halves down here. It's very important. And what we know is proportional to this uh, logarithm of the number of particles inside a Coulomb sphere, uh, sorry, a, a Debye sphere. This number is in the order of 15 to 20, as I said, for a plasma. And there is this dependence on uh, mass of the electrons and the uh, uh, number, the charge number or the atomic number, uh, the charge number of the, uh, uh, of the ions and the, of course, electric charge square. So this is the expression for resistivity. But what we see is that uh, by pure Ohm's law or ohmic heating, uh, if we apply an electric field for driving a current inside the plasma, we have a very little efficiency to heat the plasma at very, very high temperature because the higher the temperature of the plasma, the less the resistivity is. So. Uh, very, very high temperature fusion plasma have very little resistivity. They are essentially ideal conductors. Okay, so essentially, why did we do all this and all this exercise for uh, understanding uh, what is the role of collisions and why uh, collision between particles are important and how particle equilibrate with each other and uh, 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 how they can exchange energy and momentum, uh, what is the origin of the plasma resistivity. These are all physics ingredients that describe microscopic processes, but uh, the legit legitimate question will be, uh, why do we care inside a, a reactor? And we want fusion reactions, we don't want uh, Coulomb collision. And here is the answer, okay? So let's try to uh, plot in this plane. Here is the cross section. Uh, barns uh, are units of the cross section is 10 to the 24, uh, uh, minus 24 centimeters square. And uh, uh, here is uh, the uh, energy uh, of the uh, deuteron because uh, we will see in a minute uh, deuterium tritium uh, uh, interactions are those that are most efficient. And we plot what is the probability of having a fusion reaction inside a plasma as a function 
of the energy, okay? Remember that temperature was one of the key parameters for uh, defining what is the characteristic of the plasma. So here we have temperature. And here is, we have a measure of the probability of the uh, reaction. So we consider DT, the deuterium tritium fusion reaction. And here is the behavior of the cross section. Now you can ask yourself, what is the Coulomb scattering we have been talking about so far? And here it is. Okay, so you see that in whatever range of temperature you are, even at the peak for 100 keV, uh, reactors will be operating down here. So it's even more so. But even if you put yourself down here and at the peak of the fusion reaction uh, uh, probability, you see that there is a huge difference, more than 100 times, difference between the Coulomb scattering cross section, the fusion cross section. It means that before two particles, one deuterium and one tritium, get together to produce one fusion reaction, there will be for them at least a hundred times, if not more probability to do what uh, we just described. So they will be undergoing many, many Coulomb scatterings, many Coulomb collisions. So in order to understand what's going on in a fusion plasma, in a thermonuclear fusion plasma, we need to understand Coulomb collision because otherwise we will not understand what is the effect of Coulomb collision on the more rare uh, fusion reactions. So uh, this essentially is the turning point in which we move towards more applied stuff uh, that very likely will be more of your interest, but I think I demonstrated you why we need to concentrate on the fundamental properties of plasmas on their density, temperature, characterizing what is the behavior of the Coulomb collisions inside the plasma and understanding how long it takes in terms of equilibration time for uh, ions and electrons to equilibrate between themselves and among each other. Uh, quantifying that in terms of the scattering cross section and the time it takes for particles to be deflected by 90 degrees. I think that those are all very important elements and you will not understand the behavior of uh, burning plasmas if you don't understand those terms. So uh, let's say, what is the fusion reactor scheme? So the fusion reaction of primary interest are, in, uh, are listed here. So uh, the DT fusion reaction will be producing a helium and a neutron at 14.1 MeV. The thermonuclear energy release is 17 because this has roughly four MeV and has a threshold energy. We will come back on uh, uh, soon of what is the, the threshold energy of about uh, uh, 4 keV. 4 keV turned uh, into degrees Kelvin means 4.5, 10 to the seven, okay? So 10 to the seven, remember, is uh, uh, tens of millions degree, okay? This is the threshold energy. So it means that uh, reactors tend to operate at 100 million degrees in the order of 100 million degrees. So the DD reaction <clears throat> is also possible and has two equal channel of probability, one that produces tritium and proton, and one that produces helium-3 and a neutron, and uh, has a much lower <clears throat> energy release and a, a much higher threshold. Uh, and the same for D helium-3, uh, which produces an alpha particle similar to what we have here, and a proton, okay? Of course, uh, having a helium uh, here, which has a proton instead of a neutron inside the uh, three, uh, uh, nucle the three heavy uh, uh, nucleons that are inside the nucleus, uh, will be a proton rather than a neutron here. But other than that is very, very similar RUC in terms of the uh, energy release. And that's still higher, a little higher uh, threshold energy. Now, let's try to see, given what is the thermonuclear energy release, which is remarkable, is in the order of tens of MeV for all these reactions. What is the critical cross section and what, what is the threshold? Now, we see that uh, the uh, reaction rate uh, is not anymore the cross section, but the reaction rate is cross-section multiplied by the velocity 
averaged over the distribution function of the particle, because of course, you will not have any more only one velocity, but you have a distribution of velocity. Now, if you take a distribution of velocity uh, that is being given by a Maxwellian and you average over it, you obtain the uh, reaction rate average over the distribution function. So it's more representative than uh, the uh, single uh, parameter for one single energy that I was showing before. So rather than cross section, we introduce reaction rate. <clears throat> so you see that the DT reaction is the one that has the highest reaction, uh, reaction rate and uh, it tends to have a finite value even at the lower temperature. Now, let me ideally put a threshold value down here in the 0 0.1 over this scale uh, that is in meter cube per second times 10 to the 22. Let's assume that there is a threshold down here. So this gives us, in, in terms of uh, in imaginative uh, way, what is the threshold energy? I will come back to that later uh, more quantitatively. Uh, but there is clearly a threshold, and this is the threshold energy I was uh, mentioning before, is uh, less than 10 keV here. Here is the uh, deuterium helium-3, and here is deuterium deuterium. So it is clear from this figure that the lowest threshold is in the DT reaction. And uh, of course, uh, this one is also the one that has the highest reactivity. And that is why DT reaction is targeted for the fusion reactors. Now, what uh, I would tell you here is that in order to uh, think in terms of uh, environmental friendly, uh, still DT produces neutron. Uh, the neutrons produced inside the uh, DT reactions are not such to create long lived uh, radioactive uh, uh, wastes. However, they are still there. So there are problems with the activation and this is one of the uh, issues for fusion technology, which is what you're studying. So the uh, use of proper materials for reducing uh, the activation of the plasma facing component. What is uh, very, very appealing for the D helium-3 is the fact that we don't have neutrons and we only have charged particles. So it will be much more efficient in terms of energy extraction and much more much safer in terms of uh, uh, activation and problem and technology problem for the radioactive side. Uh, the problem with the helium-3 is that uh, there is this huge difference in terms of the uh, reactivity, especially if you go at the low temperature. Remember that operation regime for a, a fusion reaction in DT is around this, is in the order of uh, 20 to 30 keV. Uh, instead for a D helium-3 reaction will be much higher uh, than that and will be higher than 100 or in the order of 100 keV uh, with uh, all the problems that in terms of technology are brought by operating at higher temperature. Now, uh, what uh, we need uh, to do in order to ensure that the uh, fuel cycle is closed uh, of course, if we go for D helium-3, D exists uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 a fraction of percent of all the hydrogen in nature, so it's not an issue. Uh, supplying the deuterium uh, is easy. On the contrary, T is radioactive and has a lifetime, a half time of uh, a little more than 12 years, and therefore it must be produced because it's a very, very short half time. Uh, this is actually what makes it safer because, uh, uh, as I said, there is no uh, intrinsic, very, very long-lived uh, uh, radioactive material inside the fusion uh, cycle. However, uh, because of this, you cannot think to find T in nature because it has a too uh, short lifetime. So we need to produce it. So uh, neutron uh, producing DT fusion reactions allow to close the fuel cycle, especially using uh, uh, lithium as an uh, active element for exchanging. Uh, this is in the blanket, and it's called the breeding blanket. Breeding blanket because it's supposed to be able to produce tritium enough uh, to close the cycle after a certain initial amount of tritium has been introduced in the uh, fusion reaction cycle. So if you start out with some tritium, 
you produce your fusion reaction consuming tritium, and then you use the neutron inside the blanket to produce other tritium that you can recover and close the fuel cycle. Now, uh, if you take uh, this type of channel, uh, uh, has a, a, a cross section of 950 barns, B here means barns, is the unit I was showing you before uh, that are the natural unit uh, 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 used for uh, quantifying the fusion, uh, uh, quantifying the cross section at the nuclear level. Uh, this is much uh, larger, okay? Uh, but however, has a problem that lithium-6 that enters in this uh, reaction channels is about 7.6% of the natural lithium. Natural lithium is lithium-7 and uh, it could be used also. However, what happens here is that this cross section is much lower than this, roughly a factor of 1000. So if you go for this, so for a blanket that has uh, a breeding blanket that is based on lithium-7, you will need a much higher efficiency in order to re-extract all the uh, tritium that uh, you, you need to close the fuel cycle. So uh, said so, uh, what, what do we do in order to confine the plasma? In order to confine the plasma, we have typically uh, the uh, concept of magnetic confinement, uh, which uh, is what we will be discussing from now on. And uh, here you see the plasma uh, particle that are inside this uh, cylinder, schematic cylinder. And you see that they move around uh, erratically. Instead, if you superimpose uh, to the plasma uh, a magnetic field, uh, which is very useful for uh, uh, the confinement purposes, you see immediately that each of these particles doesn't move around wandering, but they tend to move longitudinally along the magnetic field line in spiral trajectory. So rather than having this disordered trajectory typically uh, similar to what happens in a uh, usual uh, ideal gas, uh, you have this behavior where the uh, uh, motion is, uh, uh, is ordered because in the perpendicular direction to the magnetic field line, it's possible only to deviate, deviate only slightly by a Larmor radius. Uh, and instead, there is a free motion along the field line. So essentially, this is the reason why we are using this type magnetic field type confinement. However, of course, still the motion in the longitudinal direction is still free. So uh, sooner or later, I mean, the, the particles will reach the uh, endpoints of this cylinder type. So the idea was uh, uh, to overcome, bypass this by the toroidal geometry. That means uh, this cylinder type uh, structure is closed topologically into a torus. The torus is this donut shape thing in which in yellow you see the plasma, in blue you see the magnetic field lines that are these ones. And uh, uh, the magnetic field is produced by these toroidal field coils that will produce naturally only uh, a toroidal component. So things that are going only around in this direction. I hope you see the hand. Uh, instead, you see that these uh, uh, field lines are actually twisting over uh, the surface of the plasma and inside the plasma as well. And there is a reason for this, actually is a reason for stability. We will see it more uh, later and tomorrow. Uh, but most importantly, the reason is that uh, in, the to in the toroidal geometry proper of a tokamak, what is happening is that the uh, plasma is heated up to a significant fraction of their operation temperature by letting a plasma current passing through the plasma itself. And by passing through the plasma itself, the current generated generates uh, the twists of the magnetic field line because it creates a magnetic field in the short direction around the uh, plasma instead only in the long direction. Now, uh, what is the schematic view of a fusion reaction, uh, reactor, sorry. Uh, of course, for you, uh, 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 is, is like a, a very, very cartoonish type uh, description, but at least you see 
what are the essential elements. So we have the plasma inside, we have lithium outside, uh, and this is the blanket. And of course, there is a, a moderator and uh, uh, for extracting the heat. And uh, let's say there is, uh, here is water. Uh, actually, there will never be water inside uh, uh, a fusion reaction for various reasons. So other type of coolants are, uh, are used in order to extract the heat and bring it to a heat exchanger that then uh, goes to a turbine and a generator, and then it goes to the grid. And so this is very crudely speaking, uh, the uh, cartoonish type, a more artistic view of the fusion reactor is what you see here. Uh, you see again, the coils and the plasma inside uh, in addition to this, uh, you see uh, a number of, of, of uh, elements that will be needed. For example, there is this uh, robotic arm for remote handling. There is uh, uh, this source of uh, 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 radio frequency waves that are used for uh, uh, heating and, cur and driving current inside the plasma. Uh, we will see in detail all the various scheme uh, uh, in, uh, late, later on in tomorrow's lecture. Uh, there, there is, of course, uh, the heat transfer process that eventually uh, captures the uh, heat produced inside in excess inside the uh, uh, blanket uh, uh, that is surrounding uh, the breathing blanket that is inside that closes the fuel cycle because the DT ashes are uh, recovered and restored here and uh, sent to a pumping uh, to extract the tritium and reclose the cycle. So this is a much more artistic view. So at this point, I think uh, that we are ready to uh, discuss the last point of today's lecture, uh, which is the power balance inside the reactor. Okay, so uh, the power balance inside the reactor is uh, in steady state, at least uh, we will see later and tomorrow, especially what happens in the uh, time dependent scenario. But essentially we have uh, diffusion power produced by diffusion alpha particle, alpha particle because these are the helium-4 nuclei that are produced in diffusion reactions that we saw before. And we have an additional heating because of course, uh, as, as I said, we need to heat up the plasma. Uh, we need to deliver uh, some power in order to bring the plasma in the condition where the uh, fusion reaction take, can take place. So this on the left hand side is power input. Okay, so is the power input we provide from outside and the power input which is provided by the nuclear reaction inside the plasma. So this is power input. And of course they ha this has to balance the losses and the losses can actually have either uh, in the, can take place either in the form of radiation the radiation losses, or in terms of uh, uh, transport processes that occur inside the plasma, because the plasma uh, being a charged gas, as I said before, uh, is not quiescent. Uh, and uh, typically like uh, what you have in a boiling pot containing water brought to uh, boiling, uh, uh, of course, uh, one can have convective cells and other type of uh, fluctuation induced dynamics inside the plasma that eventually lead to loss of the uh, energy that is stored inside the plasma that we are bringing in because of the external heating or because of the uh, power produced inside the plasma volume because of the DT fusion reaction. So these are all elements that we will analyze in either today's lecture or tomorrow in particular the alpha power, the volume averaged for a DT mixture of 50%, of course, 50% uh, of deuterium, 50% of tritium providing the ion will be essentially proportional to uh, Ni squared to the four because each of these two is Ni over two and it will be the product of the two. And you see the fusion reactivity and the energy produced by the alpha particle. So this is coming out from uh, uh, what uh, we uh, we saw before, and is essentially the rate uh, of diffusion reaction happening inside the plasma. 
uh, again, uh, the additional is uh, the supplemental uh, by additional heating uh, and other uh, type of uh, sources that needs to uh, is needed to keep the reactor in steady state. And uh, we will focus on the losses and the uh, uh, by by transport and by radiation in uh, the lecture tomorrow. So. <clears throat> It is possible uh, in general uh, to take an, into account of the losses uh, from a fusion plasma uh, through the concept, uh, uh, crudely speaking, of the energy confinement time. That means uh, if we have the uh, losses and the radiation losses, losses by transport and losses by radiation, uh, we can postulate that that is given by the typical time uh, it takes for the energy, which is this one, to be lost from the, uh, from the plasma volume. That means uh, if we know what the losses and the radiation losses are, the energy confinement time is the ratio between the content of the energy over the uh, power loss. That means the content of the energy will be three halves of the density and temperature in energy units for uh, the uh, plasma given by the electrons and the same thing given by the ions. If density of electrons and ions and temperature of electrons and ions are equilibrated because we can confine on a sufficiently long time in steady state the plasma, then this is 3n times t over the uh, losses and the uh, radiation losses. So the energy that is produced in a DT fusion reaction uh, consists of the energy of the neutron, which is 14.06 MeV, and the alpha particle 3.52, okay? So essentially we have that the total fusion energy produced in a fusion reaction, that is the sum of the two, is roughly five times, if you take the sum of these two, you see that this is roughly four times this one, is roughly five times the energy of the alpha particle. Now, uh, let's try to uh, introduce a, a quantification of uh, the uh, power balance in terms of uh, break-even and ignition condition. So break-even and ignition are defined comparing the fusion power and the P alpha with uh, uh, the total losses, okay? So we have the break-even condition. So break-even means we go out uh, uh, with the, uh, whatever we put in, we get out, okay? So the fusion power, the total fusion power is balancing radiation and losses by transport. This is the break-even condition. So if we uh, put inside what we get out, we go, uh, for each kilowatt we put inside the plasma, we get one kilowatt of total fusion power out. This doesn't mean that uh, the efficiency of the reactor will be one, because then when you have the fusion power, you need to convert the fusion power into uh, power again. And therefore, this is not a, a condition of getting uh, one kilowatt in the grid for one kilowatt you spend. You spend one kilowatt and you get out in terms of fusion power, one kilowatt. Ignition condition instead is when P alpha, the power that is coming only for the alpha particle is balancing the losses. Why is this ign ignition condition? Because it means uh, that in this condition here, uh, in order to have the power, power balance, you don't need to put anything inside. You, this is the total input of power, nuclear and external. So if you can shut down the external power input, so you don't need to drive except for starting it up, your reactor, it means that uh, your reactor is sufficiently in good condition to stay in steady state by the simple fact that you are producing fusion reactions inside the plasma. And this is ignition because the plasma brought to ignition condition will go by itself. So ignition condition is what we actually are hoping for. So uh, uh, let's say that in general, only one fraction 
of diffusion power can be reused uh, uh, to balance the losses. Okay, so uh, the, the the thing is what I was saying in terms of uh, uh, yield and the efficiency of uh, the system of uh, uh, the system of reproducing uh, essentially net electricity out of the fusion power. So we know that the total losses are essentially three times n times t over tau, tau the energy confinement time. And these in order to have an efficient reactor should be less than a certain factor eta that we can control uh, times uh, the fusion power. And the fusion power is given by this expression, okay? So now we are simplifying the parameters to the least, assuming that there is equilibration between electrons and ions and that they are at equal density. So it's a 50-50 reactor in which uh, is a 50-50 mixture of deuterium and tritium. Now, out of this, you can, of course, express or explicitate n times tau e in terms of all the other parameters. So out of this, we, we basically say that if n times tau energy confinement time is larger than 12 times t over uh, fusion reactivity times this eta. Note that all these things are function of temperature only, okay? Except eta, okay, which is a parameter. So if we can take n tau e larger than a function of temperature, we would have an efficient reactor at this point. Everything would work. So uh, it is common uh, in the analysis of the power balance to introduce uh, uh, the power gain factor. Power gain factor is uh, called Q and is the ratio between the fusion power and the additional, heat, uh, the additional heating power. So the additional heating power from the power balance is the loss minus the power of the alpha particle. And P fusion, of course, contains uh, the alpha particle power, but also the neutron power. So it will be roughly a factor of five P more, right? So essentially, because of this, Q is given by one over eta minus 0 0.2, okay? This eta here, okay? So in general, we can re-express uh, this expression here, explicitating eta as a function of Q. So this eta factor that is needed in order to have a proper functioning uh, of the reactor, assuming that this object here is satisfied, which is the condition for uh, uh, the um, power balance to be satisfied. This eta is essentially Q plus five uh, over five times Q, okay? And Q again is the ratio between the total fusion and the additional a heating that uh, we are putting uh, from the outside. If we don't uh, put anything from the outside, Q will be infinity, right? It's uh, quite obvious. So these, these values, obviously, eta, Q, and so on and so forth, are also related to the fraction of P alpha over total the plasma heating, right? Because P alpha uh, plus uh, the additional heating is P alpha over this, and the additional heating because this is Q over Q plus five. Now, Q over Q plus five is essentially one over five eta. So the, all these numbers uh, are just parameters that are being used to classify uh, how good uh, we are approaching the uh, ignition condition. So we said before that the break-even condition is eta is equal to one. Okay, so because is when this balances P fusion. And eta is equal to one means, means that Q, just you put it down here, is 1.25. Sometimes, even though quite erroneously, but sometimes the break even condition is being called when Q is equal to one, but is actually eta one, and Q is a little above one. This factor Q, the fusion power over the additional power. So the ignition condition obviously is when we don't need any additional power and Q is going to infinity, but if Q is going to infinity, of course, this means that eta is 0 0.2.
Finally, uh, of course, there is a, a more or less empirical, uh, uh, empirical criteria in which, of course, if this factor eta is 0 0.2, then we will be uh, not in need to put any uh, additional eating from outside. Uh, there is a, a, a certain person, Lawson, that introduced his own criterion. Uh, the Lawson criterion, in which he said, okay, so if eta is 0 0.3, uh, more or less we can accept the functioning of uh, the actor. It's a uh, purely uh, uh, more or less reasonable or convenience choice for eta being treated as a parameter. If you plug in back here, you see that for Q equal 10, uh, basically Mr. Lawson was uh, saying that a reactor could work nicely. Now, on a plot, the Lawson criterion together with the break-even and the ignition condition are here. This, again, is n tau e. Remember, we have to uh, put together n tau e and uh, uh, t because, sorry, because this right-hand side is only a function of t because it's temperature, and here is fusion reactivity, and I showed you before that fusion reactivity is only a function of uh, the temperature. So uh, in this plane, n tau, n tau versus temperature, eta is equal to one, which is the break-even condition, is this one. The ignition condition is this curve here. And above all in this region, there will be the perfect uh, uh, fusion reactor that doesn't need any external power input. And what Lawson uh, was empirically stating to be the criterion for uh, the reactor to function is given by this other curve. Now, this shape of the curve, of course, is uh, connected with the bell shape of the fusion reactivity I was showing you before. And we picked up the uh, behavior of the DT fusion reaction. So you see that uh, the point uh, for a minimum value of n tau uh, corresponds to something in the order of 20 to 30 kV for the DT fusion reaction, as I was anticipating. And uh, uh, depending on the value of n tau t, uh, we will progress from break-even to loss on criterion to eventually ignition condition. Now, if you are asking, what is the progress? Uh, of the triple product, actually, it uh, here uh, we I, I didn't introduce the triple product yet, but sometimes it is because here uh, diffusion reactivity uh, near the peak depends on t square, and therefore one will be simplifying the t here, and uh, therefore if you have a linear dependence overall in the denominator, you will be able to say that the condition uh, will be essentially on n tau e times t. Uh, the triple product, if it goes above a certain critical value, you will be having either uh, the break-even or the Lawson or the ignition condition. So because of this, uh, looking at around the peak of the performance, which corresponds to the minimum value of here, you see that there is a t square here, right? Dependence. So if this t square dependence is taken into account and uh, this t is simplifying that, you will be able to collect everything over there. So uh, the progress in the triple product uh, that has been done throughout years, and so progress, the performance triple product is here, progress over year is here. Uh, okay, so you see that these in blue are essentially all the tokamaks. From the first tokamak in uh, uh, USSR, it was still Russia, uh, called USSR back, back then. Is uh, uh, then Since then, of course, there has been many, many uh, tokamaks uh, progressing towards the most recent experiences with JET is still in function in uh, United Kingdom. Uh, TFTR is a machine that has been dismissed in the United States. And uh, uh, JT60U 
is a machine in Japan that is now being replaced by another machine that is called, called JT60SA. Um, so you see that uh, throughout years, there has been quite significant improvement towards this target. Here, this target is the target of ITER. ITER is the big uh, international experiment, means uh, International Tokamak Experimental Reactor, and uh, is being constructed by uh, an international collaboration and uh, is uh, supposed to reach around uh, big Q is equal to 10, which is the Lawson criterion, essentially. And uh, this is the target. So you see, we are not that far away. And uh, uh, in order to make uh, uh, an advertisement uh, uh, of fusion uh, progress uh, with respect to what other fields are doing, uh, here is uh, how the accelerator have been progressing. So uh, this is uh, what the fusion community says to show they are better than the accelerator community. Uh, this can be debatable, of course, depends how you plot things out. But uh, of course, it shows remarkable progress and even shows that uh, it's even better than the Moore's law, which is the very popular uh, transistor number doubling every two years that is uh, in computer science. So let me come back uh, a little bit uh, on what I was introducing before and uh, is what was the threshold temperature for uh, uh, the various type of reaction and uh, the uh, ignition condition uh, that we said is P alpha is uh, balancing essentially the losses and uh, the, the uh, losses because of radiation. Uh, because of this, it is uh, interesting to compare P alpha not to all this uh, possible loss channel, but uh, with respect to what cannot be uh, avoided. And the fundamental radiation loss that cannot be avoided is the Bremsstrahlung or uh, uh, the breaking uh, uh, radiation uh, translated from, uh, from the German. We will go back to this on the lecture tomorrow. So uh, what people do uh, uh, is they, they compare with this because of two reasons. One, because uh, the loss because of Bremsstrahlung cannot be avoided. So if we cannot, compensate this loss with the alpha power, uh, there is no way we can make a fusion reactor work. This is the fundamental reason. Second, because the loss by Bremsstrahlung can be calculated quite simply. So you can see it plotted uh, on this uh, graph that I was showing before. Again, is the uh, uh, essentially the, the, the uh, power density generated by uh, the fusion reaction versus the temperature and this is the power lost by, by the branch strong. So you, you see that there is a crossover point here. So at low temperature, definitely there is no way we can make a reactor work because it will be dominated by branch strong. So uh, everything that works below this temperature is uh, has a, a negative power balance because uh, all the power you are uh, generating by DT reaction will be overcompensated by, by Bernstein. Above, instead of uh, this curve, uh, the power producing fusion reaction will overcome the Bernstein. So this crossing over point is uh, essentially the uh, ideal ignition temperature and is the threshold temperature I was introducing before. So we are now at the end of the lecture. So uh, uh, what uh, needs to be uh, kept into uh, account is that uh, when, uh, because of this reason, because of this uh, 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 need of compensating the Bremsstrahlung losses and also the other losses, and because the fact that uh, all the various radiation losses depend on the atomic number uh, by very strong, power also, uh, there must be a limit in terms of the atomic number over which it's absolutely impossible to uh, tolerate uh, a certain number of concentration of impurities inside the plasma. 
so far I was referring to pure plasma, but just imagine what happens uh, if you introduce from the outside because of the interaction with the material wall, uh, impurities with high atomic number Z, uh, they will start radiating like crazy. And uh, of course, this Bremsstrahlung will go up and there will be other uh, elements in the loss uh, channel in the radiation losses uh, increasing. So in this plot, what I am showing is the maximum impurity concentration. That means the density of the certain impurity over the uh, density of the deuterium tritium fuel uh, with respect to the atomic number. So you see uh, that above this concentration, essentially what we do, we break down uh, this simple criteria. So we cannot meet the ignition temperature. So uh, you see rapidly that uh, as the atomic number increases, the uh, fraction of the maximum impurity concentration you can tolerate inside the plasma goes down very, very dramatically. So you go from uh, a 10% dilution in the range of Z of order one, three, four, uh, and uh, uh, you go very rapidly down to 0.1 per mil or, or 0.01% when you go to very, very heavy impurity, like in the range of 50 to 60. So this is uh, the reason why uh, the uh, uh, concentration of the impurity inside the plasma is uh, a big problem. And this, of course, uh, pertains very much the technology of fusion reactors and the design of the surrounding uh, uh, structures of the plasma, because of course, controlling the right level of impurity and the right level of densities of the various species inside the plasma becomes crucial. So at this point, uh, we are at the end of the lecture. Uh, sorry, I took 15 minutes longer than expected. So the exercise I would like you to to, to take into account is uh, uh, to consider on the first part uh, the Poisson equation and actually demonstrate that the solution I provided with the screen Coulomb potential is indeed the solution of this uh, differential equation. I think this is a rather simple exercise, but is instructive for you to do. And uh, what I also would like you to do is to repeat the derivation of the Rutherford cross section, which is given on pages. 12 and 13 of these lecture notes using uh, the formulation in the center of mass frame. And this, uh, the reason why I would like you to do this is because I would uh, really like you to um, get a deeper understanding of the functional dependencies of the Rutherford cross section on the reduced mass and uh, uh, the energy and the scattering angle, because that is crucial as I showed for calculating what are the relaxation time for uh, the particle scattering, the momentum exchange and the energy exchange. Okay, so thank you very much, especially for your patience. It was a little long lecture. I think that Grazie, tomorrow Fulvio. will be much more easy going. Mi senti Fulvio? Si, si, ti sento. Va bene, grazie a Gra tutti. Grazie, grazie eh, per la pazienza. Ci vediamo domani, grazie. A domani, grazie, buona giornata a tutti.